Hello, everyone. Now, I can kind of see people. I can kind of not see people. So I'm just going to do my best as we go forward with that uh, kind of idea. So it was a pleasure to talk to you today. It's a pleasure to be here, basically, after lunch. Everyone's a little bit full, I know. So I'm going to try to talk to you about some things that connect some dots. I connect some dots to what I heard in the morning in the sense of I've kind of thought about what I wanted to talk to you as we went forward and decided that I would try to pull some things together and then instead of going forward with what I was originally going to exactly talk about. So I want to talk about you and I want to talk about your influence on science. I want to start though with a fantasy. If you'll just stick with me for a moment. Basically, it's going backwards. You saw some of the fantasy already. I want to talk about a fantasy. Basically, imagine a world where sooner or later, each one of you gets a phone call. That phone call in my household is going to go something like this. Bring, bring, hello. Hello, this is a call from the oddly named Office of Science Deliberation. What? You know, deliberation, like, you know, like juries do. When people get together, they talk about an idea, they get some information, they debate it out, they hear perspectives of other people, and they come to some sort of conclusion. Well, you've been selected with 24 other people in your community to come to the university and talk about some new research that's about to be done on producing synthetic meats for human consumption. Now, this may not be a world that we actually want to create. I actually see a lot of problems with it. But it's a space, it's a theoretical space that I want each of you to put your minds in right now and to think about, to think about the talks that you heard this morning and to think about what it might enable. I want to use that space to tell you an experience from my own life, a true story, not a fantasy, although the fantasies will come back, they always do, and kind of start to link some of the ideas we've heard. Basically, this true, true life story involved us gathering 25 random strangers from across British Columbia into a room for four days to ask them to deliberate a to on a topic about an emerging scientific technology. In this case, the topic was sequencing the salmon genome, We're getting all the genes in a salmon. Basically, what we were asking these people to do is fly to Vancouver, skill up, spend some time le learning about this topic, and then to tell us a little bit about what they thought. This is pretty much what we were doing to them. Sticking them in a room, saying, salmon genes, discuss. <laughs> yeah, um, looking back on it now, I can see why that looks a little bit odd and a little bit weird. Sure, this is a fine topic for scientists to talk about, maybe salmon biologists, maybe even salmon farmers. You might even want some policymakers there. But for retired factory workers, for IT specialists, for nurses and students, for every day you and me, what would we talk about when we heard that Norway, Chile, and Canada are coming together to decipher the genetic code of salmon? Eh, you know, I have to say, I was a little bit nervous on thinking about this, on thinking about what was actually going to happen. I was a little bit edgy. There's not many parties that I've been to where salmon genomics, salmon genetics have led the conversation. But in thinking back to it now, I could take comfort a little bit from one of the comments of the participants at the end of these four days. This is what he said, in quotes, scientists can teach us, and maybe we can teach scientists. Why would we even do this to begin with? Well, let's take a couple steps back first. I think it's important to think a little bit about the idea I'm putting forward here, and to get to know me a little bit, so that you can see where this is coming from. Basically, what I'm talking about here is applying a political theory in a movement called deliberative democracy to science. When I'm talking about deliberative democracy, think processes like juries that bring together people to discuss a topic and debate it out. But in this case, instead of some heinous crime, we're really talking about a scientific advancement. Deliberative Democrats call for this type of a change because they want to move us away from a world where we just aggregate pre-existing preferences. In the sense of, if I ask this room, do you think we should sam sequence the salmon genome? Some people might put up their hands, some not. But would that be the answer you'd give if you were involved in a process that allowed you to learn about what it was? Allowed you to learn the costs? To hear from some experts? To hear from some people that would say, it might do this, it might do that? 
In that kind of a space, would your original preference still be the same? It might, and it might not. And would it be the same if that collective space forced you on some levels to either say what your disagreement was with it or to come to a conclusion? So in this case, really what we're asking and I'm thinking about here is what can we as the public, as people, as students, as retired nurses, as IT specialists, teach science instead of the opposite of what science can teach us. I have been a science geek ever since I tried to decontaminate my own oil spill for a grade seven science project. Um, it was a spectacular, spectacular failure, trust me. You can ask my father and you can ask some of the teachers that uh, I tried to convince that I should get a good grade of. But that moment right there really taught me about the value of discussing science. Even if I couldn't wrap my head around the chemistry of oil exactly. The value in talking about it. While I was deep into an undergrad, basically learning about science, I fell into love with my first, basically, scientific organism. In this case, Dictostelium discoidium. I'll come back to that later. I'll go forward to... There we go. This is the one I want. I'm going to come back to the other one. Dictostelium discoidium. Basically, this little amoeba lives on the forest floor. Remember, I'm asking you to stick with me. We'll get back to the salmon genes in a second. This little amoeba lives on the salmon floor and eats yeast and bacteria. But when this food runs out, it does something amazing. It actually signals to its kin to come together and begin to form a structure, a slug, that you can see with your eye. This slug then crawls to a new force of, source of food. Right off the bat, I was amazed. In doing this, it even packs a lunch. In terms of bacteria, it likes to eat. It brings them along for the ride. During this process, some of the cells in the slug you're seeing here give up their lives so that others can survive. I went on to study this for quite a little bit of a while, really being interested in it, really being a microbiologist, until I felt like my life wasn't as charmed as it could be. Working in a lab with no windows, lots of radiation, and experiments that kept me up till dawn. It takes about 24 hours for this guy to do this. So we had to sit and watch it with video cameras. I felt that I had to move on again to learning about science. I went on to become a science journalist. And during that time, felt that my writing might be a way that I could pull people together, to envelope you into talking about science, into learning about it, into the discussions that I felt I took for granted because I had them every day in the lab, these scientific debates about what we should be doing and not doing. But in doing that, after a bit, after being a journalist for a while, I began to seriously question whether my journalism could ever really allow you to learn about science in any particular way, to really engage with it, to really open it up, to see the trade-offs that are involved in it, to see the value choices in what brings it forward in some ways, to really have a say in our scientific future. Think about the 3D printers and whether or not you have a say in that. Think about the connectome and whether or not you have a say in that. And think about the first talk and whether or not there are ways and processes that we could believe in that may allow us to break down some of these barriers and some of this like-minded thinking. So really what I was interested in that sense is whether or not we could bring out the scientist in all of us and whether or not we could bring out the public in the scientists. What you're seeing here is a deliberative event, a style of one that went on at UBC on biofuels production, where people got together, basically in small jury-like format, to discuss out a topic to see what they had to do. And at the end, were asked to come to a conclusion and recommendation for how they thought this science might be good forward. This is just an example of what we're trying to ask people to think about, the space and the plane that we're trying to get them into, in the sense of what can we give to science as opposed to what science can give to us. So I'll leave you with this comment for one quick second. And I want to ask you a question in all seriousness, and I hope I can see everyone. I'm going to go like this so I can. How many of you in the audience have ever actually feel like you've influenced science? All right, I'm seeing, I saw about three or four hands. Think about that for a second. There's probably about, let's say, 500, I'm told, here. And out of that, five probably people that I noticed feel like they've impacted science in their lives. Some might say, well, why would you ever want that? Why is that important? Others might say, you can never get it done anyways. But that is perhaps 
one way to view it, until you start thinking about the impact science has in our lives. Think about how, what it's done for public health. Think about all the interesting inventions it's brought forward. Think about examples where people want to adapt our medicine, personalized medicine, to our genomes so we can avoid side effects. Think about the fast-growing Aqua Vantage salmon that the FDA is currently looking at and thinking about approving as the first genetically modified animal for human consumption. Think about Olympic athletes that have recently been reported to be experimenting with gene therapy to improve their performance. Think about companies, and connect this one to the Connect Dome talk, like No Lie MRI, which basically say they have truth justification technology based on, based on MIR, MRI imaging that can detect lies in your brain. Think about people like Ray Kurzweil, the IT guru and futurist, who says he's developed a reg regime that can reprogram his biochemistry so that at age 62, he can live to the year 2045 so that he can make it to a spot where he feels humans and machines will merge and that he might have the potential for immortality. In that type of a space and with those examples, it's pretty easy to see some of the social and ethical questions that might arise. Some of the questions that we might have about what does it mean for us not to have a say in our scientific future? For me, it's really an issue of trust in many ways. And how science is going to maintain and develop our trust, mine included, as it goes forward. And I don't see trust in this sense as simply placating you so that we can advance or usher in a new technology. But I'm understanding it more as a debate about whether we should, and if we should, how we should, democratize science. So that one, it's more representative of what we would think here if we put this question to you and had a little bit of a debate out. That in that way, it's more transparent and we can see how scientific inventions come forward. And because of that, it's more accountable to each of us. Now there's debate here, without a doubt, and a lot of it, in the sense of when we think about our scientific future, I asked you guys at the start to think about whether or not you'd want to go forward into a space like that or not. There's definitely debate about whether that should, may, should happen. Some people say that you should never connect science to democracy, that there's no democracy when we're talking about whether or not the earth goes around the sun. Other people talk about science as culture science as politics, that there's little point to modernist divisions between science on one side and society on the other side, especially when you think about topics like climate change and oil spills and that transgenic salmon that's about to get approved and will soon be at your supermarket. When these topics are so narrated, so social, that it's so very hard to ever consider them as truly natural, in that space, it seems very inevitable to me, someone who's come from a grade seven oil spill to studying an amoeba and really falling in love with it and thinking science is just the mo most amazing thing out there, to someone that was a science journalist and is now dealing with how would you govern something like people wanting to sequence a, a salmon genome when you don't know what those technologies are gonna do, you don't know if they're gonna be beneficial or not, and it's very hard to predict, and you don't know if someone's going to come up with this great invention that turns a salmon into a vegetarian, which basically people are working on. So you can feed them corn instead of fish. So in that space, it's quite natural to me that questions have naturally arisen about which scientific topics are the most important to get put forward. Which scientific topics are the most appropriate? Which science topics should we fund and not fund in many ways? What we did is basically began to develop an experiment, a way of thinking of how we might bridge the gap between experts and scientists talking about these questions, because they do, and they talk about them a lot, and they come to their conclusions, and public viewpoints that might have a different take on that in some ways, and the gap that may or may not exist between the two. In the sense of, if you think of the Connectome talk, you think of the original um, Mitchell's um, amazing first talk this morning about how we start to think like-mindedness as we get into our groups and how scientists and polymakers, if we allow them, and maybe we should in some instances, I'm not saying this is a cure-all, 
to just think amongst each other, that they may never be exposed to perspectives that would break that down. Oh, excuse me for a second. Yellow. Hello, this is the oddly named Office of Science Deliberation. What? You never came to your event on human consumption. Oh, well, you know, I don't really know anything about that. Why would anybody be ever interested in listening to me? This leads us to a big question of if we did want to do this, how do we ever do it? How do we ever bring people together? Well, one way and one thought that we look towards is if we developed out a process based on people giving their reasons for what they believed in. We brought them together, gave them all the information they needed to be able to understand it, so that scientists and other people couldn't say, well, they didn't know what they were talking about, or they didn't know whether that was really what it meant, that they had that opportunity to learn deeply about a topic. We then gave them the opportunity, and these are 25 people we bought, brought from across BC together to Vancouver for four days, to talk to the experts that they needed to. They could even suggest the experts if they wanted to. To debate out with them what they thought these issues were. were. To confront them and ask them, well, what does this mean? What do you mean by that? And what are you going to do if you actually end up doing that kind of stuff? We then booted the experts out so that people could be comfortable. 25 people could be in the room and feel like they could talk without some sort of vested interest coming down on them. And we then, over the four-day period, added a structure which broke them into small groups and asked them specific questions about what they thought the salmon genome should be used for, what they thought the benefit was, and what they thought the concerns were about it. We gave them that opportunity, and at the end of the four days, we asked them to come together and provide either some recommendations as a collective about what they thought scientists and policymakers and governments that view salmon might want to think about when they go this forward, or if they couldn't agree, because we were not forcing them to agree on anything, it was just kind of if it happened, what those disagreements were and what they looked like, to clearly explain them. It was an interesting event. It was something that changed me very profoundly as someone that came from a journalist, um, a microbiologist to a journalist, and thought about these particular ideas. In particular, people talked about things like, the salmon is so important to me that both physically and spiritually, if anything ever happened to it, I would die. This put, seriously, this put scientists and those in the room on point, that we were talking about a fish that was very important to people, that we were talking about a future that they felt was very important to them, and that out of this may come some ideas on how we go forward. And I wish I had time to describe these more. I put the website up so people could see. There's the report recently that you can read. But I want to end briefly, because I only got a few more minutes here, by just talking about what this meant, and what I want to take away as the message here. What it meant for me was that I was amazed as people came out of this four-day experience, thinking that they would never be interested in salmon, never knowing about it, but coming out of it and walking tall. Of talking again about democracy, not in a way like it'll never happen, or oh my God, I'll just let it go. Talking again about science and the interest of it. And it lit a fire in me that was originally lit again by that amoeba way back when, and that's why I talk about it, about how we can help each other to actually deliberate and think about the future we want to go forward, and how these processes, which have problems in terms of how you frame them, whether people involved really do get the information they need, whether or not they really deliberate, and whether their recommendations will actually be used and listened to by anybody, that these are issues we can work on, whether or not these processes can help us to think about how we want to interact with the talks we heard today and are going to hear in the afternoon. Basically, that's the message I want to leave you guys with, that I think science can learn a lot from us and not just teach us things, but we can also teach science things. Boing, boing. Would you answer the phone? Thank you very much.